collective wave, thumbs up. Awesome. I'm Sarah Stolpa. I'm the founding CEO of PPAC, um, the Philadelphia Photo Art Center. I don't know how many of you have, um, are new to our organization, so I just want to talk about who we are. And so um, I welcome you here, and I, um, in this very difficult time um, with so much um, at stake and so much um, darkness, it's really be wonderful to have a community where we can celebrate light and photography. And so I'm glad to see everyone here. Um, it's given us an opportunity about to rethink who we are and how we um, do our programs. And tonight is the first iteration of a program like this, um, a new thinking for us. And so um, PPAC is a, a artist focused institution dedicated to a diverse broad range of audiences. And we engage people in contemporary photography through education, um, resources to make work, and exhibitions. And so um, we have online classes, which you should definitely check out if you haven't done so already. Um, we do exhibitions. And so we have one exhibition online now, and we hope to do more in the coming months. And then um, along with our exhibitions, we do programming and talks like this. So I'm happy that we're still able to do it in this context and to connect with everybody. Um, PPAC is a nonprofit, um, and we can only do things like this because of the support of the people in our community. Um, so if you have the capacity and if you're able to support us in any way, um, we would um, greatly appreciate it, whether it's through sharing our programs, sharing our classes, or making a donation, everything helps. Um, <clears throat> so thank you for being a part of this community and being here tonight. And I get the pleasure of introducing uh, PPAC's exhibition and program coordinator, Lori Wozelchuk, um, who is a dynamo artist and documentary and documentary and conceptual artist, as well as um, a fierce advocate of the community um, and a community worker. So um, she is an invaluable, um, team member of PPAC to help us do our work, um, not only exhibition and program wise, but also our um, commitment to the community. So I'm excited to launch our Thursday night photo talks, which are every Thursday at seven, um, with Lori being um, our first speaker. Lori? Can, I, can you hear me? I can. Okay, great. Hey everybody, welcome. Um, I want to give a shout out to Michelle Wallace, who's also like on this call handling the chat room. So if you guys have questions or have something to add, um, feel free to put it into the chat room and Michelle's gonna um, help us um, uh, through that after I'm done talking. But for now, I'll go through the whole lecture and, um, and then afterwards we'll have a conversation. Um, yeah, I forgot, sorry, Lori, I forgot to mention that. So during the talk, if you have questions, just throw it into the chat and we'll address it at the end. And then we'll open up for Q&A, not only through the chat, but through raising your hand, um, which you can do under chat. Yeah. Yeah. No, participants, you hit on participants and then you get to raise your hand. Yeah, and then if you raise your hand, I'll call, I'll, I'll signal you. Um, and if you wanna be, um, so this way you can ask, ask your questions um, through the microphone rather than the chat, if that feels more comfortable for you. So we'll have time for both at the end of the program. Um, I also wanted to say that we're recording this um, talk and we're gonna um, put our, our Thursday Night Artist Talks on, um, on our website so you guys can see it or you can share it with people in the future. Um, uh, one more thing, because I know some people drop off before we end. I just wanted to say that um, uh, PPAC is offering a lot of online classes right now and I hope that you can check out that on our website. Michelle's gonna add a few links and also we have launched um, an open exhibition called Every One of Us um, and we are asking for anybody and everybody to contribute is one photograph that represents their experience in the in um in the 
pandemic? Um, how is it affecting your life? What are you noticing? Um, who, who are you happy to be sharing space with and those things? So uh, go to the, um, the link and we hope that you will submit your images and we will exhibit this. We'll be posting it on, on an Instagram feed, but we'll also hopefully exhibit it um, once we can gather face-to-face, uh, -face, people to people instead of online. Um, all right, I'm gonna start the thing. Go ahead and talk and I'm gonna open up my, my lecture. Yeah, so Michelle at PPAC, who's our Youth Education Associate and who's been um, the leader of our social media and helping with our online ex uh, education opportunities, <clears throat> just posted the link to every one of us in the chat. All right, I'm ready to go. Mm. You should go. <laughs> so um, uh, I wrote a little thing, so I, it's going to look like I'm reading, and I am reading. Um, so in, in thinking about this talk, um, and, and as we were closing down Philadelphia Photo Arts Center, and as everybody was closing down their schools and their jobs and everybody, and, and, the, and everybody sort of retreated into their home, I kept thinking about um, what happened in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina and, um, and revisiting, and the idea to revisit the work, um, it came out of this because I feel like there's some similarities and there's some things that um, uh, bring back uh, a lot of painful memories about New Orleans um, and what happened there, and also um, some beautiful memories about New Orleans. Um, so I'm revisiting this work because we are experiencing the world changing day by day in the COVID-19 pandemic, and we are experiencing a slow moving crisis that severely hinders our, act, our ability to act, make things better, to solve ever growing problems. The other correlation between our experiences today and um, the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina is that people that we elected to guide us through crisis are coming up short. And the lack of leadership, I believe, is contributing to casualties as it is today and as it did in 2005. Before working on this talk, I listened to a new podcast and I posted that link in the um, chat box already. It's called Floodlines, produced by The Atlantic. It's an incredible feat of storytelling and journalism. I'm so grateful that 15 years later, a journalist is willing to go back and, and go through what happened on the ground um, and, and represent it in a new way. Because every time people process these stories and process um, mistakes and, and solutions, we can learn from them. Um, and I can say that from listening to Floodlines, um, that each story and each misstep that they report and, and um, their story about how fear and racism um, contributed to hijacking the narrative in New Orleans. Um, on the local state, in, after Katrina, the local state and national leadership responded to the people stranded in New Orleans as criminals based on unsubstantiated rumors, as if the folks who just survived a hurricane were looking to do anything but live through it. The leadership used war metaphors, not unlike today, to describe chaos in the streets, when in the end of the day, the people causing chaos were not the survivors, but often were the police run amok and, and the military. The governor announced that the National Guard would shoot to kill civilians caught looting, shooting their own citizens. Um, the mayor was begging for martial law. The chief of police was claiming that there were snipers shooting people, which never happened. So all of these stories are recounted in floodlines, and, and, and there are so many parallels, especially with this war metaphor, when we're dealing with a humanitarian crisis and all our leadership, the lack of imagination when our leaderships can only bring uh, war metaphors to how we're going to uh, solve this problem. It just shows a lack of imagination. It shows a lack of um, creativity. It also fixates, fixates on um, crises, as in New Orleans, they fixated on the looting, um, and they ignore the human suffering, um, and suffering becomes invisible. As a journalist, I was not immune to the fear-induced panic. I was frightened, and the lack of information after, during Hurricane Katrina was, was um, debilitating, really. Um, and as a photojournalist, I'm always processing and witnessing trauma, and I felt totally inadequate. I remember standing to, at the edge of the water one day, and I couldn't move. I was paralyzed because I didn't know which way to go because the whole city was crying and was in pain. So this slideshow is about continuing to work and finding a way to respond, even though you feel inadequate, even though 
one person feels like they can't do anything. Um, and it's about also connecting to other people to actually speak louder, come up with creative solutions and, um, and thinking forward um, and reclaiming the narrative, right? That um, people, that the governments and, and um, people in power tend to inflict in, on civilian and on citizens. I continue to think about New Orleans as an island connected to the rest of Louisiana and the country by its bridges and roads. roads. Katrina smashed assumptions that these massive bridges, these utilities created to create transport, transport people in and out of the city, create wealth, expand, um, expand communities. Um, their functionality depends really on our intentions and our politics and our aspirations, our fears, our hopes, all of, all of the things that we build can crumble when we don't, when we don't think about them in the way that they should be thought of as a way to grow community and build community and connect with one another. So this project um, about New Orleans is filled with those days of realizing that the bridges that we built um, to connect, to generate, um, to generate opportunities uh, failed in many ways, but, but were then again repurposed to rebuild. That was my speech. Um, so, uh, as I was saying, while, while the trauma was going on, the bridges became points of contention. This is the picture of the Crescent City connection. It, it, it connects the East Bank to the West Bank, um, over the Mississippi. And as people in, who were stuck in the convention center tried to walk across the bridge because there were, nobody was coming, there was no water, there was no food nobody was coming they decided to walk over but the police in gretna having heard of all these all these terrible stories um rumors um and myths about new orleanians in the aftermath of the storm they blocked them at rifle with at gunpoint and they were turned around the danziger bridge was another bridge where people who were holed up in a dentistry office um on the east in east new orleans we're, was, we're gonna head to their home to see if they could get some food on the west side of the river, um, of the canal, sorry. Um, they, they couldn't make it, the water was too high, so they had to turn around. Um, and somebody reported that there was police under fire on this bridge. And um, I think about nine cops on, on unmarked cars and not in uniforms responded and hunted down these, these two families that were walking over to find some food at their own homes, turned around and they hunted them down. They killed two and maimed two more and they arrested um, another person that was with them. So the bridges became this point where it was, I was driving on a bridge every day in and out of New Orleans. I was photographing, I was living in Baton Rouge. Um, I was ho giving, uh, we were hosting or giving refuge to journalists. At one point, there were 14 journalists staying in our house, and we had to cross the waters every single day. We'd leave before day daybreak, come back at night, um, and the bridges carried us in and out, but it could not carry the people stranded in New Orleans. Why? Because they didn't have resources, they didn't have access to transportation, they didn't have cars, and the buses, that nobody sent any buses. It was unspeakable that for five days we were able to go back in and out and the people were stranded in New Orleans. And so the bridges became a, a gigantic metaphor for who could get in, who could get out, who has, thing, who, who has access to things and who doesn't. So I made, a, I made, I photographed the bridges and these bridges, I photographed bridges using um, helicopters and um, yeah, I, I, I did a lot of helicopter photography at that point, and I wanted to sort of document how bridges connect and disconnect the city. It's kind of quiet. It feels kind of weird that I'm talking by myself and I can't hear anybody, but I'm going to keep going. <laughs> so in the beginning, I was a journalist. I was working as a photographer um, on assignment from many publications around. So I was covering the news. I was a stringer. I wasn't so I was sent to do a lot of, at first, a lot of aerial photography, um, assessing the damage. Um, and, uh, and so I was up in the air and I, I felt so detached and so unable to do anything, but, I, but I, that was what I was doing. Um, I, I also was able to um, 
connect with people doing rescues. So I was, a lot of citizens themselves got, brought their own boats into New Orleans and they started rescuing people because the government could not manifest enough um, rescue boats to save people and get them out of the city. So there was, uh, I, I was with a lot of citizen um, rescue uh, crews. I also um, returned with um, some residents of the uh, Ninth Ward to see their homes for the first time. So I, I was, again, I just can't, I, I just kept feeling um, uh, focused on the fact that we were using cars and buses and, and the bridges to move in and out. And um, the, the theme just kept going because uh, New Orleans was stranded and it was isolated and it was an island um, surrounded by water. Um, so I traveled with this busload of residents from the Ninth Ward and they were visiting their homes for the first time, seeing the damage. It was a month after Katrina. And it took a month to clear the roads in the Ninth Ward to even get vehicles in there. I also spent time with um, people, evacuees, who were trying to get seek help, trying to get support, um, staying on the line for hours and hours and hours and, and, and um, trying to get some sort of support to help them as they were completely displaced from their homes and were living in cities that they, didn't, they weren't used to um, and they were just trying to find their way. And I went and I traveled back with people from Baton Rouge, from the North, uh, the North Shore, and I, and I uh, photographed them coming back to their homes for the first time where they could actually see what the damage was and start to clean up. And one thing that I, I can't forget is um, what it looks like when you have to throw away the contents of every house in a major city of America. What does it look like when everything has been destroyed from all the walls, every single piece of furniture, um, carpets, refrigerators, everything? What does it look like to throw away an entire city's worth of things, materials, tools, foods? Um, it, was, it was overwhelming. And then I sat, well, I remember one day, this was the first day that New Orleans could, could get back to the city, grab their things and return home. And I remember the sun was, we were on the, um, on the spillway um, and that's, um, uh, it's over the Atchafalaya Basin and, and, um, and the uh, Bonacary Spillway, sorry, it was the Bonacary Spillway. And the sun was setting and it was shining into the um, windscreens of all the people coming out of the city. Um, there, there wasn't public traffic yet back in and out of the city. Everybody was on their way out for, because there was a curfew. And so I parked my truck and I got into the back of my truck and I just wanted to see the faces of everybody coming out of the city. Um, uh, and they were beautiful and I, they started waving to me um, and I was waving to them and I just started photographing them. And um, I, I made a lot of photographs of people exhausted after spending their first day back in their homes and packing up as much as they could carry and on their way out again, heading west. Um, I've made several large collages of this work um, and I, um, it's some of the, my favorite photographs from that whole five years. But it continued to haunt the, the roads and the, and the, and the feeling of um, inadequacy and also the, the mixed messages and the Im impact of Hurricane Katrina continued to haunt. At, and so for months, um, the city was empty, uh, literally empty. And um, so I spent time um, looking for ways to document what had happened without any people, which, is, which was really, really difficult. Um, and, you know, and I found these small memorials and small, um, uh, and not, but also just um, evidence of trauma um, throughout. Um, I spent a lot of time looking for escape hatches. So that was one thing I did. I was in, in working for a response. I couldn't imagine people 
having to stay on their roofs for days waiting for rescue as the water was you know up to their rooftops um, and the lucky ones had stored an axe in their attic so they could chop their ways at, way out to the roof so they could wait on top and and um, get some fresh air and get some cool air um, because it was very very hot after the storm um, and this lucky family was able to have a cooler and to bring it out to the roof I never met these people. I don't know who it was that was on this roof, but um, uh, I spent a long time um, photographing escapes. Water lines were everywhere. Um, and this, this memorial kind of spoke volumes to me. Um, the water above uh, their portrait of Jesus, above the American flag. Um, and it was just the front stoop of someone's home. Here's another escape. Um, again, the city is empty. There's nobody. Um, uh, and at night, it went dark, completely dark. Uh, there was no electricity. Um, and I mean, I don't even feel like my pictures come close, but that's part of feeling inadequate to such um, tragedy. And, and the silence, the, these FEMA trailers were just parked in the road yard waiting to be unloaded um, for one day when the residents could come back. This is one idea. These are, they had a recycling area where all the refrigerators would be um, denuded and um, all the uh, toxic chemicals take, taken out and then they would be crushed and put into these bales. But every single kind of trash had to be treated this way in the city. It took many, many months. So as the city started to rebuild and people started coming home, um, uh, I began a project about Claiborne Avenue. Um, the pictures in Love and Concrete look at life along North Claiborne Avenue from the uh, Treme neighborhood through the Ninth Ward. It ran all the way through. The neighborhoods along the avenue generated the cultural and community roots that created brass bands, jazz funerals, and Mardi Gras Indians. It was one of the wealthiest African-American business districts in the country. The centerpiece of this vibrant neighborhood was the wide, shady Claiborne Avenue. Dozens of hundred-year-old uh, live oak trees lined the street. But in the 1930s, 60s, or maybe it was a little earlier, the city cut down those trees to erect hundreds of massive concrete columns that would support an eight lane interstate. The I-10 overpass was built to facilitate automobile access to the new outlying suburbs, but it also contributed to the economic de demise of the Treme. Once the city flooded, the overpass and its on-ramps became islands of th for thousands of stranded people waiting to be evacuated. Now, as the neighborhoods recover, thousands gather am amid the uh, concrete columns to celebrate Mardi Gras, play games, or set up small vending photo booths and other enterprises. Love and Concrete is about the Treme and how its residents reestablished their lives in their neighborhood under the overpass. So I spent two years um, photographing uh, life as people came back. Um, uh, under the overpass, there's a, they have, of course, they have a grand uh, Mardi Gras celebration there, but they also had um, uh, small business people set up their photo booths. Um, there's uh, small kitchens. They even created um, a trolley, a Treme trolley tour. Um, and so I photographed um, this great neighborhood and great people um, coming back. the Backstreet Cultural Museum, picnics, football. Further down Claiborne Avenue, um, uh, a little bit of a clash of cultures, um, uh, the New Orleans um, traditional hearse uh, passing through. Um, obviously, this was after actually um, a third anniversary of Hurricane Katrina. So they brought the hearse to commemorate the third anniversary. The Claiborne Avenue Bridge. And this is also the third anniversary. People were walking up the Claiborne Avenue Bridge because just to the right of the bridge was where the barge um, crashed into the 
um, the levee and the levee wall and that's what broke. Um, that's when it broke. And they threw flowers on every anniversary down into the water. Um, a chief of Amarati Gras Indians, Lil Percy, he was also part of the third anniversary um, commemoration. So as time went on, and this is five years, I was constantly trying to figure out ways to express um, the way the bridges connect us and the way the bridges could disconnect us. And I was just wrapped up in this metaphor. So I, I told a lot of personal stories and I connected with people to talk about their work. Um, and this story is about rebuilding Faith Temple. And let me get my notes. Um, I photographed a man, his name is Reverend Jaron Dabon and his wife Janice, and they returned to New Orleans a year after Hurricane Katrina to rebuild his father's church, Faith Temple Church of God, the Holy Ghost Center. Um, and this is in Elysian Fields. About half of the Faith Temple community could return to New Orleans. The Davons lost their home in the Seventh Ward and now live in Gretna. So Gretna is across the bridge on the Mississippi, and so he has to come in and out every day to rebuild the church and connect with his community. He crosses the Crescent City Connection, that very grand, beautiful bridge, um, daily to work at Faith Temple and assist his small church community. He still holds Sunday services in his broken church with no electricity or water. Sometimes the heat and the winter cold are too extreme to endure the church, in, in, to endure inside the church. So he, Reverend Davon gathers as many members as he can and holds their Sunday service at one of the church members' homes. So he'll drive through and pick people up and travel inevitably over bridges to pick up his um, flock and hold service in someone's home. So Reverend David believes that his church is uh, it's small, it can be rebuilt, um, and, is, and he's hoping that one day his, his faith temple community can all come back home. So that was one story that I did. Another story, and I, and I, I have, I followed a teacher, I followed um, uh, musicians, um, I, I followed as many people as I could that were trying to, trying to navigate their lives as their homes were being re rebuilt in the city, but living elsewhere and to try to tell those stories. The next is about the Alexander family. Kat and Alexander, um, they led very busy lives back then. I think this is about 2009, 2010. Nat taught math, math at Delgado Community College. Calvin rebuilds his family homes. He's got several homes, some for his children, um, and they're on both sides of the industrial canal. They both dig, we, dig, weed, and feed chickens in the Ninth Ward Community Gardens. They are active in the Holy Cross Neighborhood Association. They provide food and daily care for Nat's 94-year-old mother. And if that isn't enough, Kat, Nat, Cal and Nat help two of their daughters through, by babysitting their grandchildren and transporting four grandchildren to and from school because they've got the cars. And they provide full-time daycare for their youngest grandchild, Kayla, which means Kayla moves around town with them all day long. So this is their family. And these are their um, Katrina migration because everybody has been moving. Um, Tamara and Calvin Alexander, they hosted all of the Alexanders in Memphis after, uh, before the storm, they evacuated. Katrina was living in Little Rock, Arkansas, but she came back with her children um, so she could get a job with FEMA. Kieta and Ronald, they evacuated to Memphis, then they had to move to Mississippi, and it was a, a series of moves that brought them back. They finally were able to move back to New Orleans in July of 2007. Samantha was at school at Tuscaloosa, and uh, Lillian moved with um, uh, Calvin and uh, Natalie, um, but she came back when they came back in March 2006. So I, I did a little documentary about them crossing bridges. There's bridges all throughout the city. And um, I sort of calculate, I, I kept track of how many times the parents, the grandparents crossed the bridges. And so um, it wasn't just Cal and Nat, it was also the daughters picking up their kids and dropping them off. But these are the different bridges that they were crossing across the industrial canal. And this is just a series of the movements throughout the day and what life looked like for the Alexander family. Mm -hmm. 
lots and lots of motion. That's their house in Holy Cross. And they, she was stripping the paint on one of the doors. Her grandmother, uh, grandmother Lillian was still living in FEMA trailers as were um, with some of her daughters. Community meetings, finally taking care of putting kids to bed. So they were still working on uh, fixing up their house um, and which all that work is now complete and the families are settled um, throughout New Orleans and Memphis. It's my final car picture. Um, I wanted to end on a very, very sweet note. Can't help it. I also wanted to just briefly talk about the New Orleans Photo Alliance, um, because while I was doing my shooting, I connected with this amazing organization um, that was just, uh, and when I first came, when I first uh, intersected with them, they were just organizing. So early, um, in, in the in the early months of 2006, um, Don Marshall, who was the executive director of the New Orleans um, Jazz and Heritage Foundation, he gathered artists who were able to return at that point and, and gathered them so that he could uh, help them self-organize and plan together how to rebuild, regroup, and recreate their creative careers. Um, the, the photographers, a handful, uh, organized um, a call for entries as the first thing that they did. Um, and they organized a uh, call for entries. It was a, a big show. I think there were, um, I think there are 80 photographers in it at the Contemporary Art Center. Um, and that opened in late 2006. It was an entry free exhibition. Um, and that entry fee enabled them, it gave them the funds to sort of uh, make the exhibition, publicize it, but also some seed money to sort of carry the New Orleans Photo Alliance into the next phase. Um, and so uh, what New Orleans Photo Alliance did then was um, uh, concentrate in creating another photography festival, a bigger one um, than the first one. The first one I think had, um, it was a month long festival in 2006 with exhibitions around the, uh, around the city. Um, and uh, when they were planning the second one is when I got involved with, with their work. Um, and uh, they created a, a, the festival with speakers and exhibitions throughout the city. They, we knocked on um, galleries and tried to convince people to show photography during December, which was our month. Um, we had a, um, a photo review, a portfolio review. We, um, we were able to bring in reviewers from around the country um, and I think internationally um, to, uh, to meet with photographers to show their work. Um, we, one of our goals was to keep the prices as low as possible because we wanted to uh, support photographers who were just trying to rebuild their practice in New Orleans and in the Gulf Coast. Um, and then um, there were, I'm gonna keep going. Um, and Photo Nolo has continued. I think uh, it started in, um, it must be near its 15th, coming up to its 15th year. Um, and it's grown every, every year. Um, photography, contemporary photography before the Photo Alliance in New Orleans was not something that the gallerists were really excited about showing. In fact, they rarely showed contemporary photography. Um, and I would say that Photo Alliance had a very important role to play in the fact that the, now the, um, the, uh, the, the big galleries, the little galleries, um, and uh, are all involved in um, representing uh, contemporary photographers. Um, the photo lines kept growing. Um, we did, we have a, they have a gallery um, in uh, the Garden District, no wait, Lower Magazine. Um, Street and uh, they also so they run shows all year, all year long, and they also had created two annual grants. The Michael P. Smith grant was um, was created to honor the work of Michael P. Smith, a documentary photographer in New Orleans, um, who dedicated his life to photographing cultural New Orleans, um, and we created that that um, that grant to support photographers working in the Gulf Coast region who were working on long-term documentary projects. 
Um, and then the Clarence John, John Laughlin um, grant supports um, uh, photography of all practice, all mediums. Um, it's an annual $5,000 grant given to a single photographer. Those um, grants are currently open, and I know there's some um, New Orleans Photo Alliance people here. Just go ahead and put those links in for those open grants right now. The next thing and final thing I want to talk about is um, Katrina Exposed. This is another response to Katrina that was creative and it was, a, it was in collaboration with the New Orleans Art Museum. Steve McClansky um, came, came up with the idea to create a democratic, um, open to anyone exhibit in the premier um, museum, art museum of New Orleans. Um, he, he gave out a call and any photographer, or anybody could bring a framed piece and hang it in the museum. Um, I think there were 700 photographs in the museum um, at the end, uh, when, when it opened. Um, and it was a community experience. Um, uh, people dropped off their work, it was hung, and, and people gathered um, in this. It was actually a very emotional moment to, um, to go to this opening, um, to see how Katrina impacted all of these people, artists, non-artists, it didn't matter. Um, and so uh, it was an important event. And um, I feel like one of the inspirations for the PPACs um, online exhibition and Instagram exhibition, every one of us, it comes from McClansky's um, project and the, the New Orleans Museum of Arts project, Katrina Exposed, A Photographic Reckoning. Um, I just want to thank a few people before I start taking questions. Um, I want to thank the Open Society Foundations and the Baton Rouge, Baton Rouge Area Foundation who supported my work um, in New Orleans after the, um, after the storm. Um, and uh, I also wanted to thank Jen Shaw, who um, was able to talk to me and I could interview her about um, NOPA's uh, history. I also want to thank David Ray Morris, who is a, life, a lifelong friend and was by, we, we spent a lot of time together um, photographing New Orleans and um, he provided a lot of the images at the end of the uh, slideshow. That's it. I hope I didn't go too long. No, totally. I mean, um, I think that the inspiration of the show that you talked about at New Orleans and PPAC's um, early project called Philly Photo Day is um, a happy melding of what we're hoping to do with every one of us. And I, I just want to ask a question before I open up to the rest, if you don't mind, Lori. No problem. I'm just trying to unshare. Hang on. There we go. Okay, phew. Great. So um, I just wanted to ask, um, what do you think is the importance of photography during crises like Katrina and COVID-19? Like why is, I mean, I believe photography is really important during this time. And I'm just curious, since you've dedicated, you know, your energies towards it as, as well, what is photography's unique importance um, in these types of crises? Well, I mean, it's important to record and to remember, um, I, you know, it, we need to, we need to remember this moment and we, and, and, and we have to let, uh, we have to remember what's important to us at this moment. Um, because, uh, and oftentimes when things are very, are critical or things are quite scary, um, I know my, my mind gets very muddled and I get overwhelmed um, and photography can help focus. Um, uh, a friend of mine, Emily Schiffer, who has the, had the picture in the, the lead of every one of us, um, she shared those photographs on Instagram um, and it just, it just uh, crystallized the fact that, you know, we have to stay, we have to remember what's important as we continue to try to solve the problems. Um, and the photography can be a tool, it can be a gift, it can be an emotional gift, it can be a, um, an informational gift. Um, and uh, I know that some of, the, some of the photographs that we're gonna see coming for, going forward are gonna be um, emotionally healing. Um, I think photography can also be a problem. 
So following Katrina, um, the journalism and the photojournalism um, and the, it in a way it felt, it was like, I, I really, I, I had a very strong reaction to the way photograph, people were photographed um, at the convention center and in the Superdome and in the streets of New Orleans. And that's why you would not, I will not, I didn't take any pictures like that at all. And I actually spent five years trying to redress some of the photography that happened after Katrina. Hey, Lori, this is George. Can you hear me okay? Hi, George. Hi, thank you for doing this. This is wonderful. You, you've shared a lot here. Um, I know that when I was photographing um, Katrina, I, I would spend about maybe half an hour to an hour and a half and I'd have to back off and cry for 10 minutes straight. And uh, another thing I was hoping you could talk about was that a lot of times when I would go into a house, I'd stand outside the house and I'd ask the house for permission to enter. And I wonder if you could talk about those kinds of experience that you had while you were photographing. Yeah, I mean, there was a lot that um, I think we, we should think about that moment. Um, going into people's houses uh, was, and I, and I only went into that one with the photograph with the with the family, um, because they left the door open, and they left the picture right in the doorway, so people going by could see that the family that lived there. So I felt okay. So there was it was definitely um, something that I I didn't feel comfortable doing as well, and. Um, uh, there was a problem with what, what happened after Katrina. One of the things that was, was really difficult was how um, rescue workers and animal rights workers were using their houses as their own whiteboard, you know, with spray paint, you know, like, like I felt like people were, were not thinking about um, the homes. They were, they, were, they were thinking about them as something that no longer, longer belonged to someone. And I, and um, and and I, I mean, there are some houses I didn't include any of the um, any of the script that people wrote, but some houses had literally covered with messages between rescue different rescue agencies. They used garage doors and front porches as ways to sort of communicate to other rescue agencies, and it and it just it was hard to it was hard to see, and it got very frustrating. Um, uh, you know, I mean. Everybody, everybody had a house with a crosshatch on it, right? In that, and some people kept their crosshatch for a long time, like my friend David Ray. He kept it up for at least a year. Um, so, you know, it was a. It was, I think everybody has to make choices about um, what they what they think is okay. Um, uh, I walked into um, a foyer of a house, but the only thing left was the foyer of the house. So the roof was off right? The walls were off. It was just the stairwell, this blue stairwell. Um, and uh, as I was photographing their stairwell, a family came home, the family came home, right? And so um, uh, it was a moment where I had to talk to them about um, what I was doing and why. Um, and so that sort of changed everything for me. Um, uh, I kept up with that family and they wanted a pic the picture that I photographed. Um, but in the end, it just brought more pain to them. And so um, I don't think that they ever used it or put it up or anything like that, but um, it, it was a painful thing for them. And so, but that moment of meeting the family while I was photographing their, their foyer, you know, um, was a moment where I had to um, rethink what I was doing. Hi, Lori. Um, Hi, I see you have your hand raised. Hey. You want to ask a question? Yeah. Yes. Hi, Lori. Um, thank you for sharing your, your work with us and um, just showing us so much about New Orleans during Hurricane Katrina. I wanted to ask you, what was your thought process for the projects? Um, they have spanned a couple of years, but how did you first think of, I'm going 
going to start with the bridges and then that hood and then that family like how did you kind of come up with the series of over time I, I was in my car um three hours a day just getting there driving in well you know yeah three hours depending but in and out in and out in and out um the entire region was in cars um tr we were all passing each other by you know um constantly um you know baton rouge's population doubled in a week um and it was everybody was on the move everybody and that and i had a lot of time to think about that and i and i felt so um detached like i would cross and i it was so traumatic and it was so it was so sad that you know you'd see people at intersections and you just keep going but you could see that you could see that everybody was traumatized in this space on the roads on the bridges but i think that the the moment where i actually stopped doing assignment work was the moment that um i heard about the murders on danziger, danziger bridge um that uh and to and and as it unfolded it took it took 11 years for the police officers to be charged and, and sent to prison for the murders of those people but um i think it was the danziger bridge and the crescent city connection where the the gretna police turned away the the people who were trying to just get out of the um convention center um those were the those were the moments where i had to think about think about what are we what are we building these who are we building these things for and then as you think about the way um the economy of uh, african american neighborhoods in new orleans was gutted by the i10 overpass you know if you i mean the history is is important in all of these things and as we strive to make our cities better that you know in in our capitalist structures there's always losers right and um mm -hmm. uh yeah so it was it was it was a bit of an obsession and i feel like the last two stories i showed you was like they're great i love them i love them but you know they didn't have a home anywhere you know they never, they never yeah. i showed those as videos in um in community centers you know with all of the alexanders around and and you know i mean i think it was i mean nobody wanted those stories um but i love them and um and part of it is just trying to keep telling these stories and figuring out ways to tell these stories. And I, I'm still doing it. And, you know, the second I moved to Philadelphia, you know, I started doing it again. So, so thank you. Marty, we have a question on the chat. Do you mind if I read it to you? Uh, you mentioned that you wanted to redress the photography that took place during slash after Katrina. Can you say a little bit more about how you went about that? Well, I mean, I, while people were um, photographing what was going on on the ground, um, and it wasn't, I mean, it's just the media in a, in a way. Um, I was up in the air fo photographing things from the air because, you know, the, the photographers that went and, and into New Orleans um, uh, were staff members of newspapers and I was just a stringer. But, you know, it was difficult because I felt like um, I felt like the often the photography was was photographing people at their most vulnerable. There were guns being pointed at pointed at them. Um, there were cameras being pointed at them. Nobody was bringing water. Nobody was bringing food. But there was cameras, <laughs> and I just felt I just it was terrible and it was traumatic for me as a photographer. Um, and and the photograph the photographs had to be taken because um i think it was the um it was npr who were the first people to sort of question um the military leader Chern Chern i forget his name i don't know if anybody remembers Chernoff, just saying you know there are 10 10 there are thousands of people at the convention center with no food or water and he's like there are no people at the convention center so there was i mean we needed to have cameras on the ground right um but you know, but then, uh, but then as the evacuees were coming into Baton Rouge, I was asked to photograph evacuees for these newspapers. And I just felt like they had been photographed enough. I just felt the universe needed to stop. Now that they were safe, they just needed to be safe and be on their own. And I just needed to stop taking pictures of people who were evacuated um, 
from that situation. So it's it's about under trying to figure out how to be a um, a reporter that is that with that has is is it's more than just the story. It's about connecting to the people that are in front of your camera, and um, and uh, trying not to be part of the problem. Um, and I'm not. I don't want to blame any journalists because journalists have a really hard time. I think, like I said to George, I think we all have to make. You know, when we're out working, we have to make decisions that we can live with. Period. We need to understand what we can do and what we want to do. Um, and everybody is different, and everybody has their own moral compass that you should believe in. And I don't want to. Um, I don't want to judge anything. I just want to say that we're unique and and when we're working with people we just need to make sure that we understand that we're working with people and um and make moral judgments that we can live with ourselves we can go to bed at night and feel okay and sometimes um i haven't felt okay i have many nights where i've gone to bed and i haven't felt okay Or can i ask you another question yeah so what do you think photography is going to do during this crisis, what's going to be the benefit of what we do? I mean, I think some of the benefit of what we do right now is what we're doing right now is keeping people connected and people um, feeling safe, not only health and food and financial wise, but feeling safe as a community wise. Because I've heard that from several people that they're really lucky they feel really lucky to be part of this photography and art community and it feels like a really um positive place and this and a refuge um yeah, yeah. For people. but i just kind of wonder i mean because you know we're doing pbac is doing that every one of us initiative to you know gather photographs and i think it's really important because i think it's really important for all of us to understand everyone's experience through this um but i find myself very um lost in some ways because we don't know what the end of this is we don't know how we're gonna get out of this we know we're gonna get out of this together but we don't know what the world's gonna look like and i do know that photography is really important during this time but i can't quite articulate i don't know yet what these pictures are going to mean to us and i know you don't know either oh yeah no but you have to take them <laughs> you I don't mean, know what they're that's, maybe that's just the thing we don't know yet we just have to take them and we'll sort it sort it all out later you uh, have to take them and also this the the there is a lack of imagination in the way um uh leadership and power structures hand respond to problems there's a lack of imagination. There's a lack of creativity. There's lack of creative thinking. It really, really is important that that we make pictures that um, that can that we and share pictures and put put it out there. Put a different narrative, a creative narrative, an inventive narrative, something that and something precious. Um, our eyes, what our eyes are seeing, is precious, and um, it humanizes our universal experience but it also sparks each other's experience, right? I mean, I guess that's, yeah, I guess that's one of the most interesting, I mean, you said it very, you said it at the beginning of your talk that the, you know, the government and the powers that be had no creative solutions. And that's why I think artists are so important during these times. Um, Cause we practice creativity. I mean, I think all people are creative, but no one, only artists um, practice on, on a regular, well, no, but, you know, I think the creativity is the thing that's going to get us through things like this. Um, yeah. So I love hearing you say that. Yeah. So um, if people have links um, that they want to put up here, but there's a hashtag on Instagram. I don't know if you guys have checked out um, Mark Strandquist and his fabulous people, but it's called Phil the walls with hope love rage i think that's it rage 
I can look at my Instagram, but I turned off my phone. But uh, check you can it always out. email it out because we have everyone who um, came in today. So this is the photographer. Um, ah, it's Strandquist story. S T R A N D Q U A. Oh, yeah, Lori just put it into the chat. Yeah. So um, check it out because there's they're collecting uh, poster graphics and they're um, printing it in their studio and they're wheat pasting it all around the city. So if you want to check out some really great, positive, wonderful work, they're doing stuff. So there's a lot of people thinking about this. And I think the more we do these um, collaborative I projects, um, and that's why I wanted to talk about NOPA. George was one of the first founder members of um, NOPA. And I know there's some others out there. I mean. They really gathered, and New Orleans Photo Alliance has been run by volunteers for its 15 years, yeah, 15 years, and um, they really have had a huge impact culturally in New Orleans, especially in the, in the photographic arts. Um, so, yeah. So does anyone have any other questions before we wrap up? I just want to say thank you, Lori. You're your depth of, of sensitivity and feeling is always incredibly inspiring to me. I, I find you to be unique and, and wonderful and I love you. Thank you. Um, I, I don't know, can I? No. Sure, you can. I don't know. <laughs> and first of all, I want to apologize. Mine was not muted during this in the beginning, so I'm sorry. Oh, it was fine. We didn't hear anything. Um, what were we supposed to hear? My email beeping in between. <laughs> five seconds. I, I just, I, I'm, I, I'm just grateful for this. Um, it's nice to be around people, my people, who understand that as soon as this went down, the first thing I wanted to grab was my camera and go out and start documenting it. And everyone in my family was like, you can't do that. And I thought, well, yeah, I can get a mask and go out with my camera because, you know, that's where my passion is. And I really appreciate this talk. Your photographs are just amazing and the narratives with them. And I, I'm just, I learned more about uh, what happened in New Orleans that I had not known before. Um, I think I knew um, abroad information, but you really brought some like intimate stories, um, and I just I'm just appreciative, and I thank you for doing this. Thank you, and I want to let everybody know that um, our next speaker next Thursday night is Daniela Zalkman, um, and uh, she's a powerhouse of a photographer and artist um, and an organizer who started Women Photograph. Um, and uh, she's gonna be talking about her project. Um, and then I have people lined up uh, through uh, May, um, including uh, Nicholas Mulner, Zoe Strauss, Debbie Cornwall, um, I'm, I'm sorry, oh, Zora Murph. So there's people coming up um, and I'm really excited about uh, having these artists um, share with us coming for every Thursday night that we are in our houses and then beyond. Yeah, I wanna thank everyone for being here and thanks for being part of our uh, Philadelphia Photo Arts community and keep in touch, keep, keep connected, um, submit to every one of us, look at our classes, share our programs like tonight and our educational programs, support us financially if you can. Um, and I'm just really inspired to keep doing the work that we do because of all of you. So thank you for being an inspiration to us. Thanks everyone, see you next week. See you next time.